Must get in class. Thank you.
All right, let me get this poll. Uh, let me get ready. Sorry, I didn't go through this first. I have written some like critical thinking questions. Um, I've only made it through chapter 15 though. So so hopefully uh that'll that'll be good. I'll try to get chapters the rest of chapter 16, 17, 18, 18 but um I might post them later, is what I'm saying. There's only four people in here so far, and that's fine, I guess. We can go on with that. I was just hoping that we would have more people than that to play. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Show the dog. There's two dogs in here, actually, this time. This one, which you can't see because he's down here on the couch and he doesn't like me to lift him, is Meatball, um, who wasn't here last time. The other one is Spaghetti. Spaghetti? Come here. You want to have a minute? Meatball? Not having it either. They'll come visit in a second, I'm sure. Yeah. I'll show you guys, no worries. Um, all right, let's get started. Okay, so we know that uh, chapters 11 and 12 being with dealing with the microbes, cleaning them, either from surfaces or from human bodies, you know, um, and then 15 and 16 dealing with the immune system in it and acquired. Um, and then 17 and 18, um, you know, problems with the immune system and then diagnosis. So a lot of this dealing with fighting against the bad guys. So yeah, obviously that would be defense against the dark arts. Fighting. 
Oh, that's the root of all. Okay. So first is chapter 11. Um, this is dealing with microbial control. So which of the following terms is used to describe removing all microbes, including all vegetative and the endospores? Right, so this is going to be sterilization. Um, if we were to go through the other terms that were choices here, we know that asepsis is dealing with cleaning from living surfaces, disinfection, removing vegetative microbes from non-living surfaces, and then decontamination is mechanical removal of microbes. All right, which term refers to the removal of microbes from living surfaces, like the skin, of course? Right, yeah, so this is going to be asepsis, you can also call it antisepsis. It honestly is the same thing, really, when you break it down, but um, yeah. All right, true or false, because it involves moisture and heat, boiling is an effective way to sterilize things. All right, so that's going to be false. Um, boiling does not get rid of the endospores, so that's the reason why it's not good for sterilization. All right, true or false, autoclaves sterilize items by using heat, moisture, and pressure. That is true. Good job, guys. That one's pretty straightforward, easy one. All right, another true or false, ionizing radiation like gamma rays are an effective way to sterilize items. Basically asking, can it sterilize? Do we use it for sterilization? All right, so we do, and it is effective at, at doing that. Remember, ionizing radiation, we are taking radioactive waves like gamma radiation, and it hits uh, molecules, any kind of molecules at all. It doesn't matter if it's living or otherwise, but what it does, it will cause um, like electrons and, and stuff to basically pop out um, uh, from the orbit of whatever it's hitting. So in your own tissues, for example, losing electrons randomly from molecules all throughout your tissues. And then when, when that happens, that makes your atoms become ionized because we're losing the electrons. Um, and that's what causes the damage and the tissue as well as the DNA associated with it. All right, which term means that the agent will likely kill the microbe? Yep, that's going to be microbicidal, just like homicidal. Is that he complains a lot. He's very vocal. Okay. How do surfactants work to control microbial growth? All right, so yes, so surfactants are like detergents, so detergents fall into the, the category, but they are amphipathic. So they can have a positive head or a negative head, but either way, they're going to have a charged head and like usually um, a hydrophobic tail, a lot like our phospholipids and our lipid bilayer. And so they can mimic that and squeeze in between our phospholipids and then cause like it to break open. And that's how they cause the membranes to leak. All right, so that, that's all the questions that we have for chapter 11 in the Kahoot. So remember also we have terms, um, all the terms relating to controlling the microbes and knowing the differences between them. So whether it's talking about asepsis being on living and disinfection being on non-living, but otherwise they're controlling vegetative microbes. Sterilization, you know, killing everything and decontamination and mechanical removal. And there were other terms that we learned as well throughout the chapter. Um, just be aware of what they mean and, and the differences between them. The physical versus mechanical control, um, physical 
where things like using heat or cold, um, those were some example drying even was an example of physical. Mechanical, now we're here, we're talking about mechanically removing microbes. So literally separating them um, <clears throat> by a mechanical means from the environment. So filtration falls into mechanical. If you were to literally be scrubbing off your skin and not using any detergent at all, you'd still remove some microbes. That would be mechanical removal of the microbes. Once you start introducing other things in there, then it might become chemical control, for example. But, but yeah. Um, and then we have the chemical control, and we didn't really get into that really in the questions here um, too much, but we did touch on surfactants, I guess. Um, the halogens, the phenols, the alcohols, oxidative, we really only talked about hydrogen peroxide with that. Surfactants, aldehydes, gases, acids, and alkalis. If you haven't um, gone over the video that I did on Wednesday, um, touching on chapter 11 and 12 and making like those, those charts kind of outlining that they summarize that pretty, pretty well, what you would need to know about what and outlining and removing out any of the superfluous information. So if you haven't watched that um, study session or whatever, then I would recommend going back and looking for that one, but yeah. Um, halogens being things like chlorine and iodine, alcohols, of course, isopropyl, um, oh, I, know, I jumped over phenols, but alcohol is being isopropyl and ethanol. Um, they do affect cell wall, cell membrane, and can coagulate proteins if there's enough water present, which is why 70% um, ethanol or isopropyl alcohol is more effective than 100%. Um, phenols, here we're talking about literally actual phenol or carbolic acid. This is the same thing. Um, and then we have phenolics like triclosan and um, uh chlorhexidine that's it chlorhexidine and that's like one of the main ingredients in hippoclines hippoclines is what we use for surgical scrubs now of course chlorhexidine might be the phenolic which is derived from phenol that is effective at cleaning microbes um, it is not sterilizing but it is still pretty effective and um, that's why we combine it though with surfactant um, which would be a quaternary ammonia, probably a uh, detergent, so that you're, you've got the sudsing action, you've got the phenolic action, and you've got the mechanical scrubbing itself all working at the same time in a surgical scrub. So Hibiclens is typically the formula that is used um, to accomplish that in that you know, surgical scrub setting. So, yeah, but um, oxidative, like we said, that's going to be really just hydrogen peroxide, Surfactants, we talked about quaternary ammonia compounds. We even talked about ammonia in lab, about how that's a positively charged molecule. So that's our positive head, the ammonia part of it. And then the hydrophobic, just hydrocarbon tail um, to mimic those phospholipid um, bilayer setup. Um, <clears throat> aldehydes like formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde were pretty effective. We have those also being toxic though, and not very like um, you know, safe, super safe to use and, and all that. Um, so then we had OPA, don't make me try to say it because I wouldn't be able to. But OPA was a safer version, but it can't sterilize. So it is an aldehyde, but um, orthophalaldehyde, I think it is, but anyways. Um, then we had gases um, like ethylene oxide that can sterilize ethylene oxide itself is pretty toxic as well as being explosive, very explosive. So they have to um, have very specific uh, settings under which they can use it to avoid it. It's just exploding. Um, and then the acids and alkalis, if you remember anything that we've learned about uh, proteins and their structure and how they function and how important hydrogen bonds are in their structure and therefore their function, then you would know that increasing the amount of hydrogen ions or decreasing the amount of hydrogen ions in a solution around them can change their structure and therefore their function. So that's how those would operate. So that's the gist of chapter 11. Um, of course, as we're going through this, if you guys have any questions about any of these, please let me know. Otherwise, we're going to keep cranking through. All right, on to chapter 12. Chapter 12 dealt with antimicrobial chemotherapy, so and antimicrobial chemotherapeutic <laughs> drugs. Um, so yeah, so let's get into this. So which of the following antibiotics work by affecting the cell wall? Let's see. 
All right. So the penicillins, definitely. Um, and I know that the other choices are going to come up in the next questions, but I'm going to review them anyways. It'll just have to be, um, you know, just repetition as we go through the other ones. But fluoroquinolones, that's a group that falls within the nucleic acid um, synthesis inhibitors. So it stops DNA synthesis, for example. Polymyxins are um, medications that fall into the cell membrane affecting drugs. And then trimethoprim, we know because of the methyl, like methane, so it's stinky, and so are sulfates. So sulfas and the trimethoprim together are gonna fall into that folic acid inhibitor pathway. So we'll come up on those. I know we will here in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Which of the following antibiotics work by affecting the cell membrane? Go figure. So these are going to be polymixins. Again, these are more or less things that we'll just have to memorize, <laughs> unfortunately. But polymixins are the only ones that we had to know for the cell membrane. So which of the following antibiotics work by affecting folic acid synthesis? All right, so sulfamethoxazole. Um, this is, so folic acid synthesis, if you can um, get to where you can remember, like I said, that sulfur and uh, methane are stinky and it has sulf or meth in it, it's probably gonna be falling into this category, but um, for the most part. Uh, so yeah, so that's this, so sulfamethoxazole. So that was that SXT portion, usually we see it in, con um, in context with Trimethoprim. All right. Uh, which of the following antibiotics work by affecting uh, protein synthesis? All righty. So with protein synthesis, um, if it's targeting directly that, we're probably targeting the actual uh, function of ribosomes themselves. Um, so if we go back to fluoroquinolones, those guys are a group that fall within the nucleic acid synthesis, so DNA and RNA synthesis itself. Um, then we have trimethoprim for the folic acid synthesis pathway, which you, know, you guys chose that as your choice. And then carbapenem is um, affecting cell wall synthesis. So that was the last line of defense drug, but it is associated with cell wall. Um, so the last one left would be tetracycline. So tetracycline and glycylcycline, um, both kind of in their own little little group there. Uh, we also have, um, uh, um, I don't know, the, the mycins, basically, that can fall in that category as well. So the aminoglycosides include some of the mycins, the rest of the mycins, they're macrolides, but I'm not going to ask about the macrolides because they can span a few categories. But definitely tetracycline only falls into that, affecting ribosome function. So which of the following antibiotics work by affecting nucleic acid synthesis? Okay, so um, yep, the fluoroquinolones, as we're tracking along with this, those are the ones that are going to affect nucleic acid synthesis. Um, the aminoglycosides above it, those are protein. Vancomycin affects uh, cell wall, but that wasn't one that you had to know necessarily. So does bacitracin. Again, another one you don't have to know, but you do have to know fluoroquinolones. So that's how you would rule out those other two. Which of the following medications are used to treat fungal infections? Uh, 
Okay, so ketoconazole, the fungal infections, the easy way to remember them is remember them is the azole at the end. It's either going to end in azole or it's going to be amphotericin B. Like that's your choices, pretty much. All right, which of the following medications are used to treat malaria infections? Okay, so malaria is treated by, well, the original OG malaria treatment was quinine, right? And a lot of the drugs that they still use today are based on quinine. And those drugs end typically in quine or quin. We say quin, but it's the chlor chloroquine is the example that fits that category. And it is one of the drugs that is used um, to treat malaria today. So that Q-U-I-N-E is that indicator that it is with uh, malaria treatment. All right, so as far as chapter 12 goes, that's the questions that we have for the review. Um, this is all dealing with antimicrobial therapy. Some things that you might want to be aware of for this chapter, selective toxicity and other terms. So I feel like selective toxicity, dealing with um, you want to kill the bad guy and not the host, right? You want to be toxic to the bad guy, but cause no harm to the host if you can help it. That's selective toxicity, selectively toxic against the bad guy. So, um, and then that I feel like goes pretty well hand in hand with the idea of the therapeutic index. And that therapeutic index um, has to deal with the concentration of the drug that is effective against the bad guy um, in ratio with the concentration of the drug that causes bad side effects in the host. So if it takes as much drug to kill the bad guy, and that amount of drugs is also where you start seeing effects that are negative in the host. Well, that's not ideal, right? So we want to have as much spread as possible between those. Um, uh, then we have these, uh, just the categories of the drugs that can be uh, basically be uh, affected within bacteria and then the categories that are not bacteria. So within bacteria, we have these cell wall. We have protein, we have folic acid, we have the membrane, and we have the nucleic acids, all of those being categories that the antibiotics can affect. And remember, antibiotics only affect bacteria. That's it. So these are all dealing with just antibiotics. Then we had talked about the antivirals, the antifungals, the antiprotozoa, and the anti-helminth drugs. Um, the other antiprotozoa medication we talked about because we talked about malaria and they're all quinine based for malaria. Then we had metronidazole. And metronidazole is an anti-amoeba that is also used to treat anaerobic bacterial infections. Um, but those two categories are really it for our protozoa, the quinine based malaria and then metronidazole. Then we had the anti-helminth drugs, uh, prosequantil and ivermectin. Um, which I told you guys in the last, last little review, and often because you know, I'm, so, I'm so happy that my little pups made it through, but they just finished their ivermectin treatments for their heartworms, which is why they're still nice and happy. And they were playing before I got on with you guys were barking and, and fighting and all that, but now they're just all sleeping. So whatever. But yeah, so the anti-helmeth drugs, those are the only two that you'll have to know, prosequantil and ivermectin. I think that's it for the antimicrobials. Just remember that difference between antibacterial um, antibiotics uh, versus antimicrobial being everything. Okay, so next chapter is chapter 15. This is dealing with our innate immunity. So switching gears a little bit. Fevers are dangerous and they do not provide benefit to the patient. Is that true or false? All right, so that is going to be false. There are benefits to fever. They can get dangerous to the point that the danger far outweighs any of the benefits, of course. But um, for the most part, most fevers um, can have benefit there inherent that you might want to let them do their job. 
we'll talk, obviously we're gonna talk a little bit about what those benefits are. Um, hopefully we can get to those challenge questions that I have written, because that is, I did get there at least. All right, next we have endotoxin is a pyrogen. Is that true or false? This is one we don't focus on a lot necessarily in the talk, but it is there. All right, so endotoxin, which is that molecule found on the surface of gram-negative cells that our body sees as foreign automatically, it is in fact a pyrogen. Remember, a pyrogen is anything that triggers fever reaction. Yeah, pyro being fire, you can think fire causing heat, that's fever. And which term refers to the swelling aspect associated with inflammation? All of those Latin-based terms. Okay, meatball. Okay. All right, so the swelling, that's gonna be tumor. Um, if we were to go through all these words, um, what it would be is dolor is the pain aspect, rubor is the redness, tumor is the swelling, and calor is the heat. Okay. Phagocytosis refers to a cell engulfing material or other cells outside of it and bringing it inside to be broken down. Is that true or false? We've been talking about it. Yeah, it's like we've been talking about phagocytosis since pretty much day one of class. Um, but yeah, that is exactly what it is, eating things up and breaking it down. All right. Uh, which of the following are granulocytes? Could be more than one. <laughs> Remember, we stain the cells and uh, do a blood smear with a stain and then see if there's uh, basically granules or not. Granulocytes versus agranulocytes. Granulocytes have visible granules. Agranulocytes do not. So to know the difference with these guys, other than the mast cells, right? So we talk about mast cells when we're talking about allergies. So Mast cells have granules. You can remember that they have granules because we know they're going to release histamine and crap like that. That's what's in granules. So we know they have granules. But other than that, all of the granule-containing cells, the granulocytes, are going to be ending in fill. Like neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. They're the main three that you would need to know for that. All right, set. So. Which of the following is the most numerous of all of the white blood cells? What should be the most numerous? Okay, so it is going to be neutrophils. It should be quite a bit. I think it's something like 55% of all of your white blood cells or something. And I don't remember for sure, so don't quote me on that. But it is definitely the most of all the white blood cells. That might be a Dr. Shearer question. All right, macrophages are monocytes that have migrated to tissue. True or false? What are macrophages and monocytes and how they work? 10 to 80%. Yeah, I think the average, yeah. I think the average is somewhere around 50%, but yeah, clearly there's going to be quite a wide range. There. Um, okay, so yes, so macrophages. So we have monocy monocytes, they are agranulocytes that are still involved in the innate immune system technically. They are phagocytes and they can be antigen presenting cells. But once they have migrated to a tissue, they're gonna become macrophages. And if they have taken up house basically in the skin, then they're dendritic cells. So there's different kinds that they can turn into based on where they go. But yeah, once they're out of the bloodstream and into the tissues, they're macrophages. So they're kind of the same thing, they just change once they get out of the bloodstream. Oh yeah, that makes sense. 
because you already know stuff about this game and you don't pretty good there. At least there's stuff like that that like makes sense now. Like it when it lines up that way. Uh, PAMP stands for pathogen associated meteor protein, mediator protein. Is that true or false? What does PAMP stand for? Okay, so that's going to be false. PAMP is going to stand for pathogen associated molecular pattern. Um, that is basically just saying like, okay, this general molecular concept here, when I see this, that means bad guy. And it's not specific to like specifically E. coli. It's not specific to, you know, salmonella. It is specific to bacteria, for example. So things like peptidoglycan that is associated with bacteria. So that is, a, that is a molecular pattern that our body sees as being associated with pathogens. So that's what PAM is about. All right, what triggers the classical complement pathway? If you remember correctly, there are three ways to trigger complements. All right, so with the classical complement pathway, there's so take it back just a little bit. Complement being able to be triggered three different ways classical, lectin, and alternative. So classical is going to be triggered by antibody. The lectin is whenever lectin recognizes sugars on the outside of bacteria, typically mannose, but it's stuff we don't have on our cells. So it's lectin recognizing stuff on bacteria. And then we have um, the alternative pathway, which is triggered typically by things like lipopolysaccharide. Um, a lot like PAMPs, PAMPs typically associated with the alternative. So, um, but yeah, so classical, antibody triggers it. Remember, complement is a set of proteins in the bloodstream, about 50 proteins that are found always in your blood. Um, they don't have to be activated or anything. Um, they're always present there. Right, what is opsonization? I learned, we learned a little bit more about opsonization in chapter 16, but complement does um, help. One of its functions is to help with opsonization. So what does that mean? Like my nose is running, but all right. Okay, so the answer here is going to be uh, molecules helping the phagocytic process, and it's very, very vague way of wording it. But essentially, complement or antibody, whatever it is, binds onto let's say the capsule of the bacteria, and when it does that, creates a little handle for the phagocyte to grab onto. So. The phagocyte can grab onto that bad guy cell better when it couldn't, when it was just capsule. We've learned about how that can be difficult. And um, so now that serves as a handle for it to you know, eat up the bad guy easier. So molecules helping the phagocytic process, essentially. Um, Complement can do that. It doesn't have to be just antibody, but we learned about it the most detail with antibody. So that's it for chapter 15 and NA immunity. Um, we talked about our first line of defense whenever we talk about this chapter. Now, first line of defense is not just your innate immune system as a whole. It is literally talking about things like your skin and the, um, you know, acids and stuff in your stomach or, you know, salt in your sweat and, and um, lysozyme in your tears and saliva, those sorts of things being your first line of defense. And then the second line of defense is your cellular innate immunity, like your neutrophils and stuff. We introduced um, the lymphatic system as well as the mononuclear phagocyte system, which is just the network that allows the cells to move between tissues and organs. Um, we learned about how the lymph has to be moving from the extremities to the heart. That's the only direction that it moves. And that in order to move that way, we need a skeletal you know, muscular movement. Um, to pump that. So if you're not walking and, and moving and stuff, it doesn't move. 
um, the granulocytes, the fills mostly, and then the agranulocytes, which will include monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, that's the monocytes plus, and then the lymphocytes, which we'll talk more about in the next chapter, but that's your B and T cells. Remember that all white blood cells are called leukocytes. It's the same word. Leukocyte, white blood cell, that's all the same. And um, we got into the inflammatory response. We did talk a little bit about that with those Latin words um, and fever response, which falls in line with the inflammatory response. Remember that the whole kind of point of inflammation is to get fluids and the cells that come with the fluids into the area so they can start reacting to damage and creating damage control, walling off possible infection, and all that sort of stuff. Um, Complement cascade, and it's three different pathways of action we kind of already went over. All right, so that's chapter 15. So we're going to move on to chapter 16. Acquired immunity, or B and T cells. So what is the purpose of CD4 positive T cells? What is their main function? Let's jump it right into it. All right, so our CD4 positive T cells are our helper T cells. We have CD4 positive, we have CD8 positive. Those are the only ones that there are. So CD4, they're the helper ones, and CD8 positive are the cytotoxic ones, the ones that are going out and killing infected cells. CD4, their helper, what do they help with? They help activate B cells on that side of the reaction or the other T cells on the other side of the reaction. Next, could be more than one. What happens when B cells are activated properly? All right, so this is going to be blue and green for this. They proliferate and differentiate. That's what all everybody does, right? So you're going to proliferate out, and you will di differentiate into memory cells or regulation regulator cells, which aren't on the choices here, but that is something everybody's going to do. And then we have, for in the case of B cells, antibody-producing plasma cells. It could be more than one. What function or functions does antibody serve? What does antibody do? All right, so this is going to be everything except for that darker blue. The darker blue says to signal apoptosis of infected cells. Um, apoptosis means that the cell will decide that, you know, it's done living. Basically, it's cell death, um, so self-death of the cell. And um, that's not one of the, the jobs of antibody. Um, that is kind of similar to what the cytotoxic T cells can do, though. Um, they'll start killing with those perforins and those granzymes, and then once the damage starts going with that, the cell will go and um, undergo apoptosis. But that isn't what antibody will do. Antibody will, uh, the only thing missing from here is coding. So we have agglutination causing everything to kind of clump together, the bad guys with the antibody sticking all together. Complement activation, we talked about that being the classical pathway. Opsonization to help with phagocytosis, antitoxin to bind up with toxins and keep them from doing whatever they do. Uh, neutralization, binding on the actual um, like spikes of viruses, the docking mechanisms of whatever your pathogen is. And then um, the general coding of the microbes was the one that was left out here. So coding, just covering them up so that they can go around and do whatever they need to do. 
that's the one is missing. A true or false, upon reactivation, memory B cells will produce primarily IgG antibody. Memory B cells, what are they gonna make? All right, so this one is true. So once you have been um, sensitized, your initial sensitization, your first reaction to something, you will make IgM. Then you will class switch to typically IgG. You can have signals involved in um, whatever your response is that can shift you towards some other kind of antibody. But if you are um, undergoing most typical responses, you're gonna switch to IgG at least um, as well as other things. So uh, IgG is the big daddy. We're gonna be making 80% of our antibody will be IgG typically when you're reacting appropriately to an infection. And um, once your memory cells are made, they're going to remember to make IgG and not have to go through IgM, switching to IgG and all of that process again. Um, they can still make everything, but they're going to primarily make IgG because it's faster and it does the job better. That's a good way to remember that one. I like that one. Yeah, if you guys have uh, seen uh, Daniel post this message, he's saying he remembers that IgG as being like the grandpa veteran, right? Um, the, the big uh, go to war guy. And then IgE, the everyday allergies, which is a very useful way to remember that. Like that one. All right, true or false, cytotoxic T cells are CD8 positive. Remember, we only have two kinds of T cells CD4 and CD8. What are cytotoxic? Good job. So cytotoxic T cells are CD8 positive and our um, CD4 positives are the helper cells. Which immune cells produce granzymes and perforins? All right, so this is going to be our CD8 T cells, our cytotoxic T cells. All right, next, true or false, regulatory cells are present during the immune response to make sure the response is, go, is as strong as possible. Is that true or false? All right, so it's not, right? Um, that's going to be false because they're not there to make sure it's as strong as possible. They're there to make sure that you don't go overboard because going overboard is typically what will lead to autoimmunity or something like um, toxic shock syndrome or something like that. We don't want that to be as strong as possible. We want to be only as strong as necessary. So that's what that will do for us. All right, vaccines activate the immune response by a completely different means than a pathogen would. All right, so this one is false. Yeah, you guys got this one. Um, it's just the same, right? It's the same immune system, same thing. That there's actually a reason for it. it is because we don't want to be too different because when you see the thing in real life, we want you to react like you would in real life. So, all right. Um, chapter 16 was about our acquired and specific, specific immunity, however you want to look at it, same thing. Um, where do T cells and B cells mature? Remember, T cells are going to mature in the thymus. Both of them come from the bone marrow originally, but the T cells will do their maturation in the thymus. B cells do their maturation, continue to do that in the bone marrow. What is clonal selection? Clonal selection is essentially having all the possible different um, clones of cells 
that could react to all the different antigens in your entire, you know, uh, repertoire and your initial uh, bone marrow where everything's going to start developing. Then removing all of those that could react to self, removing all the self-reactive ones. And then as we, um, after we've done that, and as we have presented um, ourselves with a specific antigen, only multiplying up the yes. one cell, its clone, and proliferating that one cell to that one antigen, and not every single cell once everything's activated. So that is how clonal selection will work. What are um, antigens? Anything that the immune system can have a response to. Haptins are things that are too small for there to be a response to it, essentially. There has to be some sort of carrier to help um, react to it. And then an epitope is the part of the antigen that the antibody recognizes. Um, like we were saying, like if this is the antigen um, on the surface of some sort of bacterial cell, the antibody might just react with this one part of it. That's the epitope. What is um, MHC for? So it's not necessarily asking what it stands for, though that is kind of a useful thing to know, which is major histocompatibility complex. What is it for? What does it do? So uh, MHC, what it does, we have one and we have two. So type one will present anything from inside of the cell. Remember the one, the eye looks like inside to me. Um, so it takes stuff from inside and presents it saying, this is something I found inside of me, please help any cell can um, do that. So all cells express MHC1 and can present stuff from inside of themselves. MHC2, on the other hand, um, only antigen presenting cells have the ability to express MHC2 and um, they will only present stuff from outside. So they go around as phagocytes basically eating up stuff on their outside and then um, taking that stuff they got from outside and putting it on MHC2 and saying, I got this from outside. Now let me go interact with the right you know, CD4 helper cell um, to start this whole process. So it's basically what's going on there. Remember that B cells can be antigen presenting cells. So they um, can interact with things that way as well. Since they are hanging out in lymph nodes, waiting for antigen to come through, it's lucky on them that they can interact with them that way too. Okay, uh, the T cell types and their roles, we've kind of already touched on that, but CD4 is the helper to activate either um, the B cells or the CD8 positive cells. Remember TH1 helper cells help with the uh, cytotoxic response, whereas the TH2 helper cells help with activating B cells to become plasma cells to make antibody. Um, the cytotoxic T cells are the CD8, and they produce granzymes and perforins to target infected cells. The B cells, um, when they're activated, um, yes, they're going to make memory and they're going to make regulator cells. That's the same for the T cells. I want to be clear about that. Um, but their effector cells, the ones that are doing the job, are going to be their plasma cells. And they're just going to crank out the antibody. The antibody, we talked about the six different functions of antibody and what it does. Um, so the plasma cells aren't doing the work themselves. Their antibodies are doing the work that's involved in the infection. And then other things, even still, even the antibody's not really doing it, right? It's more or less just mark and help out. But um, so we call that a humoral response because your humor, your the actual fluid in your body, um, the proteins floating around in it, your antibodies are what's doing the work there. Whereas your cell mediated response is going to be your T cell response because your cells are actually the ones that are doing work. They're true effector cells, right? So um, that's why we refer to it that way. Uh, antibody class switches and memory you always start out with IgM. Then you will switch to the other classes as your body uh, signals to see fit, but usually always going to involve some sort of reaction with IgG because it is, you know, the best of the best. Really knows how to how to fight the good fight. Um, and then when you have your memory uh, plasma cells, they typically already have gone through the class switch. So that more specific interaction from the IgG, that stronger reaction from the IgG is preserved whenever we go back to reactivate that later. Okay, that's chapter 16. Moving on to chapter 17. This is immunopathology. So basically looking into um, when you have diseases of the immune system. 
diseases when it's not supposed to be reacting the way that it's reacting. So which of the following is an example of a type one hypersensitivity? All right, so allergy to ragweed. So type one is dealing with allergies. You can have uh, in type one atopic or you can have um, anaphylactic. So atopic being local. In this case, allergy to ragweed, that's gonna be an allergic rhinitis. And um, that's gonna be atopic or local reaction, right? Um, anaphylaxis being systemic. Which of the following is an example of a type two hypersensitivity? All right, so this one is going to be hemolytic disease of the newborn. Type two hypersensitivity is dealing with the blood type reactions. So that hemolytic disease of the newborn is dealing with the um, RH aspect, but you could have also other reactions dealing with the A, B, or O. That's all type two. Which of the following is an example of type three hypersensitivity? Let me see if you guys remember this one. So there's one in specific that we talked about, but is not on the list. Um, the one that I hinted at, that is. All right, so the one that um, goes with type three is going to be um, SLE, lupus. Um, as those immune complexes, because remember type three is the immune complexes. So antigen and antibody making their little complexes together, kind of agglutinating together. And then those getting stuck in the tight spots in the body. It could be in the joints. It could be in the capillaries of the face and um, all over the body. The one that we talked about in class was like that acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Apparently if I close my eyes, it's easier to say, but that was having to deal with antigen, antibody, um, immune complexes that got stuck in the kidney, then, you know, neutrophils come along and react to those stuck antibody antigen complexes and start destroying the tissue in the area and that can lead to um, kidney damage. But the same thing happens with lupus and like rheumatoid arthritis, whenever we have those complexes get stuck in like the capillaries of the face where you get the butterfly rash with lupus or in the joints for rheumatoid arthritis. All right, could be more than one for this, which the following is an example of a type four hypersensitivity. I like the wolf. Alrighty, so this one, uh, we didn't really talk about serum sickness or anything. So honestly, do not worry about that. That one's not going to be on your test. Um, so really, poison ivy, if you, if you got that one, that would have been the correct answer here. So uh, which the fund would be type four. We're going to just focus really only on um, poison ivy. Poison ivy, because we have our T cell response, uh, cytotoxic T cell response, so CD8 positive T-cell response, uh, attacking your cells like in your skin as though they are infected with something inside of them um, and, and killing them, uh, even though it's just oils that are attached to the outsides um, of the surface of your skin. So that's what's happening on the dendritic cells in your skin, presenting it to those T-cells and um, uh, triggering that whole response of macrophages and T-cells basically attacking your skin. Um, that's where we get that weeping and all of like kind of say pustules, but um, I guess it's kind of it's not really pus, right? It's that weeping that, that the fluid that's being released in the blister type um, wounds that are occurring as a result of 
attacking those cells. So that is supposed to be just poison ivy for that one, not, not the other one. Sometimes I don't unselect an answer. All right. Uh, HIV is an example of a primary hyposensitivity. Is that true or false? Primary hyposensitivity. Okay, so HIV is a secondary hyposensitivity. Remember, primary is going to be present from birth. The one we focused on the most was SCID, so that's going to be genetically linked. The secondary ones are acquired somehow. So uh, chapter 17 was really, I liked it because it's set up in a way that it's like broken down into sections, but um, we had the hypersensitivities. We had types one through four. Um, type one being with the allergies that could be atopic or it could be anaphylactic, local or systemic, respectively. Type two is the blood types that could be A, B, O, or it could be RH related, which is the plus or the minus, the positive or the negative. Um, type three was immune complexes. And like I said, the one that we talked about the most in the class was that acute post streptococcal glomerulonephritis and um, a little bit mentioned into lupus and rheumatoid. But then um, type four was cell mediated. That's going to be T cell related. Now we did just talk about poison ivy being related to that. But another good example of it was the tuberculin skin test looking for um, your reaction to see if you had a reaction against tuberculosis, right? And that takes a couple of days. That's a delayed type sensitivity. And then the third one within type four was the um, graft rejection. So that's how your body rejects, uh, you know, any sort of transplanted tissue. If it does, um, it's going to be through that type four cell mediated response um, via that uh, MHC1 reaction. So talked about that a lot in class. I'm not going to go into too much detail here just because there's a lot of uh, a lot to go into now that that's probably should already be aware of it's not trying to be mean um hyposensitivity so that with that with that I will just say um knowing that it has more to do with seeing uh my MHC as, as self and then your MHC as non-self is really how that's driven remember the different kinds of graphs that we had the auto um being from the self the iso from the identical twin the allo from anybody else and then the xeno from animals or non-human species um, and, and how you would uh, see those as foreign. And that would make sense, right? But yeah, so those, that pretty much sums up that. And the graft versus host and the host versus graft, we're typically thinking of host versus graft, my body rejecting my organ, um, but your organ can reject you too if you're getting... Um, bone marrow, and that's coming with all of the B and T cells that come from the bone marrow. And those cells can see you as foreign and attack you, and that'd be the graft attacking the host. So those are different things, but they are all relating to type four sensitivity. All right, the hypo sensitivity, the, um, whenever you're, you don't have a strong enough immune response is what this is talking about here. So the primary, you have a genetic reason for not having a strong enough immune response. You don't um, have a properly uh, situated thymus maturation process, like we talked about with DeGeorge syndrome, or you just can't make your own properly functioning B and T cells like we see with skid. Um, remember that if we have issues with T cell maturation during hyposensitivity, um, primary hypersensitivities, if it affects the T cells, it's more serious because your T cells have to activate your B cells. So it kind of affects both sides. Whereas with your B cells, you're just losing out on antibody. A gamma globulinemia is what that would be called. Um, then secondary hyposensitivity, you acquire it somehow later. It's after you've been born, right? So um, that's going to be HIV or, you know, uh, being exposed to radiation, either accidentally, like from Chernobyl or something, um, or from radiation, from treatment for cancer, or, um, or having a type of cancer that actually affects your immune system, like leukemia, for example. All of these can be um, something that happens after and not necessarily related to your genetics. So, okay, that was chapter 17.
Let's move on to chapter 18. I don't know what that is. Okay, you run an ELISA to check if your patient has antibodies in their serum against RSV. What kind of test is this? This is just ELISA. Good old buddy ELISA. Checking to see if the patient has antibodies. All right, so remember that indirect um, immuno tests of any kind, whether it is ELISA or any of the other ones, if we're doing it um, in indirect format, looking to see if the patient has the antibodies. Direct is checking for the antigens. Your patient's rapid screening test for COVID is too faint to confirm, so you upgrade to PCR. What type of test is PCR? Honestly, I don't know what's going on in that fridge that this guy is do, doing stuff in. They look like a hot mess. Um, so genetic, PCR, doing testing for the uh, DNA sequence, right? That's what that's going to be. So PCR polymerase chain reaction, amplifying DNA or RNA. That's going to be a genetic test. All right, true or false. The tuberculin PPD test is an ex vivo test. Ex vivo. Are you all right, sir? Your screen. All right, so this one is false. Uh, the tuberculin PPD skin test is in vivo. I know it's a little bit of a trick there, but in vivo, it's in the body. Um, ex vivo would be outside of the body. It'd be like taking like someone's uh, liver out and doing work on it and then putting it back in their body would be ex vivo. Okay, so let's go over, that's it. Well, that's all the questions I have for chapter 18. I mean, honestly, knowing about chapter 18 is just knowing about the tests that we can do. Some of them are a little bit uh, newer to you guys, but basically being able to categorize them as phenotypic, or um, if you can put that as so phenotypic, a lot of those are biochemical. Most of those are going to be differential, right? So a lot of those are kind of all the same thing. Um, versus immunological versus genetic. And then we talked about like Malbutoff and um, scanning like uh, PET scans and CT scans and MRIs and that sort of stuff. But Going through the whole thing, um, we did talk about first about collecting specimens, really straightforward. That was God, really not anything new. Culturing those specimens as you need to. You might use selective or differential media to look for specific organisms. If you think it is a specific organism, to select for that and get rid of all the other mess that could be growing in it. Um, biochemical testing, basing that on their uh, metabolism and what they can or cannot break down because of the presence or absence of certain enzymes, right? So that is phenotypic as well. Phage typing is also phenotypic in a way because of, it has to do with um, whether your bacteria, well, your pathogen that you don't know what it is, can be infected by certain kinds of uh, bacteriophages or viruses that affect bacteria. Remember that each phage, every single phage ever, um, each type of phage that there ever is, only affects one species of bacteria. So um, yeah, so if it only infects E. coli and it, it grows and it actually shows signs that it did infect your organism, then your organism is E. coli. It has to be because that's how phages work. So that's what phage typing is. Serology is um, basically going off that concept of uh, serum containing antibodies and or antigens and using those uh, to do immunological testing. So serology and immunology kind of in the same hand in hand. Um, Western blot and ELISA, both of these rely on immunology testing. So it's going to be antibody antigen interaction very specific and very sensitive. We talked about the differences between 
specificity and sensitivity. Um, specificity dealing with being sure you're only interacting with the target um, antigen and not anything else. And then that sensitivity being sure you interact with every single one of that target antigen that could possibly be there, even in the tiniest amount. Um, Western blot, remember that was our gel electrophoresis with proteins. So separating out proteins instead of DNA and then moving those proteins onto a special paper, filter paper, and um, treating with antibody to see if the band is there or not. If it is, then positive. If it's not, then negative. So, um, and then uh, PCR and microwaves so moving on to the DNA testing. PCR, um, polymerase chain reaction, amplifying DNA. It says PCR and microarrays. I didn't really go into it too much, but remember there was hybridization as well. So that is essentially using a uh, known sequence. So like uh, my lazy example was a, 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 that shows you that it might be salmonella and then making a probe that says T, 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 T. And then maybe it's fluorescently labeled so that if it does bind to that genetic sequence, now you see um, fluorescence in the image and then that can um, be visualized by a microscope or, or um, you know, uh, some other laser reading apparatus like that, but that is what we call fish, so fluorescent immuno um, in situ hybridization. All right, thanks. Glad to help, glad to help. Okay, so, um, and then the microarrays, you just have a whole bunch of those, T, 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 and then, you know, A2CG, A2CG, whatever it is, and all these little dots on there, you put the patient sample on it, see which one they bind to. And if it bound to T, 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 then you would say, oh, okay, T, that represents salmonella. This person has salmonella and doing that like in a high throughput function. So that's how that can be used. All right, so that is the Kahoot portion of the review. Um, if you guys have any questions about that, so this would be a good time. I do have a little PowerPoint put together for chapters 11, 12, and 15. I didn't get to 16, 17, or 18 yet. That's my apologies, but I will finish them up today and post all of that on that PowerPoint, but we can go over the first half of it at least together for those who want to stay for it. But for now, here is our little podium. Uh, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and switch us to this. Yep, see you later, Daniel. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, and like I said, for those of you who are leaving, um, no worries, I am gonna post this part of it um, afterwards. So I'm going to stop there. Okay. So most of these are open-ended. I don't have choices for these. So I'm just going to be talking through them as we go. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Of course, you want to talk through the chat if you would like. So chapter, starting with chapter 11, our first question. Here is our scenario. Michael Davidson recently started working as a janitor at your healthcare facility after serving a similar position at a fast food location. Recently, there has been a rash of illnesses that have been uncommon in your facility, like skin infections and in patients you are sure you're caring for effectively. Upon questioning, Michael admits to sterilizing everything using a mild quaternary ammonium detergent. So what is the problem here? Well, um, he says he's sterilizing everything with a uh, quaternary ammonium detergent. And we know, because we definitely studied chapter 11, 
that quaternary ammonia does not sterilize. In fact, it's just a detergent. It's just a soap. So it's not very good at killing anything, but it can help open up at least um, the membrane of organisms to expose them to other things. So treating them in tandem can be helpful, but not really by itself. That might be something that would be effective in a fast food industry for cleaning a bathroom or something like that. But in a hospital setting, you probably want to be more effective than just a detergent. So quaternary ammonia compounds or quats, they're not capable of sterilization for sure. And they're probably not very good for cleaning um, a lot of surfaces that would have been knowingly exposed to diseases, especially in a healthcare facility. So um, if certain areas of your hospital or um, other facility must be cleaned more effectively, uh, you wanna use other methods. So our second question then, give one alternative method for cleaning that Michael could have employed and explain why it would be better suited for the task. I'm gonna give one example here and talk about one example here, but I challenge you guys to try to think of other things that he could have used. But my choice, I said he could use bleach. Um, it can be employed on most surfaces, especially in healthcare settings, because they're almost always like chosen specifically to be bleach friendly, honestly. Um, and it can also be used to sterilize whenever we are using it appropriately. All right, uh, chapter 12, moving on to chapter 12. Our scenario for question one, seven-year-old Timmy is brought to your care team from the ER after stabilization following an anaphylactic attack. We're presuming, or the ER team is presuming quite, you know, uh, they're quite confident that this is from an allergy to a penicillin type medication. Due to Timmy's reaction to this type of medication, your team is tasked with determining a treatment plan that is better suited to Tommy's condition. So what are some factors that you should be considering as a healthcare team and why? Now you're going to be having to consider the fact that he not only just went through an anaphylactic response and yeah, I mean, he's recovered from the anaphylaxis now that he's being brought to you. Um, but that doesn't mean that he's doing, you know, great. Plus he is, he still has whatever his infection is. So he's probably not doing great, right? <laughs> like he's really not doing great and he's really not doing great. So um, how are we gonna approach this? He's just a seven year old little guy. Um, and, and, you know, probably pretty, pretty scared and dealing with this infection, just had this reaction. So you will wanna consider his health overall. Um, we've mentioned this whenever we we're saying, talking about choosing the next uh, medication, well, medication in general for anybody, you should be considering their overall health and well-being. What their body can handle might be different after they've gone through anaphylactic shock or after they've been going through an infection that isn't being effectively treated because you didn't take a whole round of it because you had anaphylactic shock. So um, you have to take that into consideration, not just the anaphylactic shock, but whatever state he is in as a result of his bacterial infection. Um, of course, you'll need to consider what bacteria he's infected with while you're choosing your um, next medication. Maybe the front line is some sort of penicillin drug. And after that, it's kind of unclear what you should treat with. So you might want to go ahead and start with a Kirby Bauer a susceptibility test to see what type of antibiotic you might want to lean towards. But you'll also want to consider the therapeutic index because for sure, now that he's already had anaphylactic shock from the penicillins, um, you will need to be sure that whatever it is that you're giving him isn't going to make him worse um, overall. Uh, whether it's he's going to get allergic to it or not even isn't even the issue so much at this point as if there are side effects that can be caused and he's already in this fragile state. So the therapeutic index being the amount that he's going to have to take for it to be effective against this organism versus the amount that if he takes this amount, it's going to cause side effects that could be detrimental to him. So that's the therapeutic index that we're talking about here. So all of that is something that you would want to consider as part of his healthcare team. So for question two in this scenario, um, was that not question two? It's not, okay. 
so for question two, his mother also states that her son has never had any allergy to penicillin in the past. So she's just convinced it's impossible for him to have had an allergic reaction to this. It's probably not that. This is just something that the hospital did to him or something like this, right? Because this is like a number one, the most likely thing you're going to hear from a lot of people who are angry and scared. So um, this is what she's saying. Couldn't be that, but you know, so kindly and quietly, you will explain to his mother what you will say. Allergies can develop at any time, unfortunately, um, but it also our first exposure to an allergen, such as a drug that we would be taking like penicillin or a sulfur drug, is what we would consider the sensitizing dose. And you won't have any reaction to that. You won't have any visible symptoms or anything. So the first time that you're exposed to something that you're allergic to in general, you won't have an allergic reaction. It is, however, the second time that you are exposed to something that you are likely to have, since you are already sensitized, um, a significant reaction to it, especially in the terms of, um, you know, drug allergies. And so that um, can even be displayed even then as anaphylaxis, even just that second time you're seeing it. So um, that's something that you would want to tactfully explain to his mother so that she is aware of what is in fact going on. Question number three, after caring for Timmy and preparing to discharge him from your care, um, his irate mother insists that she is going to administer Timmy's new antibiotic prescription, but only until he's feeling better. And then, um, and then she's going to stop it, basically, so that she can avoid this situation occurring in the future. She's not doing this again. You and your healthcare team tell Timmy and his mother that it is imperative that Timmy complete his antibiotic regimen as prescribed, right? Because what is the risk here? The risk here is something that hit by his mother wants to avoid, you know, having some sort of adverse reaction again. She's actually setting him up for a different kind of adverse reaction. Number one, if you don't complete the antibiotics, you're risking, um, you think that he feels better. That's nice for you, but the bacteria that haven't all been killed in his body yet, think that that's particularly nice, right? So they're going to, um, you stop the antibiotic, the last few that you didn't quite kill yet, while Timmy was definitely feeling 100% better, um, they're going to grow back up and cause disease again. When they do that, they are also possibly, if not probably, going to come along with a resistance to that antibiotic that you've had him on and didn't complete the treatment with. So now you're not only dealing with Timmy coming back with whatever infection that he had, but now it is resistant to the antibiotic that you did not complete treatment with. And now you're going to come back and I'm going to have to treat him with carbapenem or something like that because you, you didn't complete his treatment the way that we had prescribed. So there's a serious risk there for that. So that's basically what this is describing here. Um, you want to eliminate the pathogen so it doesn't come back and you want to eliminate the pathogen so it doesn't come back with antibiotic resistance. That's a whole other deal. All right, chapter 15. Our scenario, 19-year-old um, college student Harold Whitmire arrives in your clinic with a very angry red swollen cut on his left hand. Harold states that nearly a week ago, he was cutting tomatoes for his sandwich when he cut his hand. He washed the wound. He wrapped it in very tight bandages. He took plenty of NSAIDs to relieve the pain. He iced the area pretty much ever since then. He's elevated the wound to prevent blood flow to that area so it won't get swollen up or anything. So the wound looks to become infected now. Um, and the inflammation is a lot more severe than it should be at this point a week later. So how might Harold's actions have actually exacerbated his wound? Well, there's a lot of stuff that's going on here. Some of it's good and some of it's just a little too good, you might say. So should you wash the wound? Of course. Should you wrap it in bandages? Yeah, sterile bandage, bandage it, but don't tightly wrap, wrap it, right? Just securely wrap it. Otherwise, you're cutting off blood flow. He thought that was good to cut off the blood flow because number one, it would stop the bleeding. And that number two, it would you know decrease the likelihood of swelling, which it does. But now we can't get blood flow to the area for the, our immune reaction to take hold. He took so many NSAIDs. Those um, NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, are reducing the inflammatory response, which is part of what you need in order to react appropriately to an infected, um, a possible infection, you know, infectious um, 
uh, concern of some kind. And then, um, so he was just trying to treat the pain with that. And he was uh, icing the area, which is even going to decrease blood flow even further, decrease the activity of any of your immune cells that would be responding in the area. Um, so yeah, so that's all the stuff that he could have potentially been doing that could have um, inhibited you know, his immune response, his innate response, which has to happen in order for these, uh, you know, acquired response to occur. So upon receiving results for Harold's blood work, you notice that his neutrophil count is low. So remember neutrophils. So why is this con concerning? Remember that neutrophils are our granulocytes that should be the most common in the bloodstream. And if they are low and we're observing that, it seems like he probably has an infection in this site. Maybe there's um, weeping or a smell or the redness is spreading a little bit, not that the bandaging is off or something like that, but there's low neutrophils also, that indicates that there's probably something wrong with Harold. He could have some sort of deficiency in his, um, you know, a neutrophil response, which could be part of the reason why he is having the, the reaction and not just because he treated it inappropriately as we um, investigated in question one. So if he's having this low neutrophil count, he probably also has this also um, a deficiency in, in his innate response as well. So I think that is all that I have. Oh, I have one more question. Okay. Harold also doesn't present with a fever, though his infection is concerning, right? You anticipate that this is due to the fact that he has been taking Advil, which is an NSAID, right? Um, like candy, basically. So why is stifling the fever a problem? We just talked about that, about the importance of the fever. But Oh, I said I was going to get into it. I guess that was what I was talking about. But so remember your fever helps to, um, when we have that raise in temperature, it helps the metabolism of your own cells. So your responding cells can act faster. It helps to trigger your um, secondary response, not secondary response, your um, acquired immune response, your BNT, so your lymphocytes, um, so that those can start reacting to the infective site earlier and faster as well. We're taking away any available iron and nutrients that are in the air that's part of the response in a fever. And a lot of times that heightened temperature can inhibit the growth of some kinds of pathogens as well. So the fever has a role to play. So it's just one more way that he could have been stifling um, his immune response, which was already setting himself up for failure since apparently it seems as though he has this low neutrophil count that's concerning, um, some sort of deficiency there. But um, but yeah, so that is essentially the questions that I wrote up for you guys so far um, for, for this study guide. I am going to write up for chapter 16, and 17, and 18 um, briefly, probably two or three questions just like these um, to help put in perspective the stuff that we have gone over for these chapters. Um, so you guys have something else to compare it to, start thinking about it in a different way and applying this knowledge in a different fashion and um, to be sure that you have good comprehension of the topics at hand. So, um, but that's all I have for now. Uh, if you guys have any questions, now would be a good time. Otherwise, I am probably going to just literally keep typing up <laughs> to stuff for chapters 16, 17, and um, 18. Yes, got no problem. No problem. So I'll probably actually stay on here because there's no reason for me not to. Um, and if you guys, uh, you guys are free to go, of course, but if you have any questions, you come back while I happen to still be on here. I'll probably be on here maybe for 15 more minutes. It's not gonna take me long to type these up, but um, I'll keep recording it. Um, so if anybody does come on, I can um, answer those questions for basically everybody. So yeah, I'll be here. You guys are free to go though.
Yun.
All right, guys, hope that is everything. And we'll see you later.